Jack and Rose had decided to call their newborn Megan Louise Dawson, Maggie for short. It was a nice name that they had discussed during Rose's pregnancy. Little Maggie certainly was a handful. She was right a little screamer, but she was loved by her parents dearly. Daily both Jack and Rose thanked God for the precious gift they had created together, this miracle. Jack didn't return to work right away. Philip had handed him a package days after Maggie was born, and when he opened it, he found six month wedges in advance. He couldn't thank him enough. It's nothing, Philip would say, would reply, not wanting the situation to become cemental by all means. And he had never had been showing Wayne emotion properly, and had always made him feel uncomfortable. For some reason, Philip had been like a father to Jack. He loved him dearly, as a friend and a father figure. He wanted Maggie to grow up with around him, just like as a grandfather. With the money which Philip had given in advance, Jack had suggested to Rose to take a little trip to Chipotle Falls in Wisconsin. It was no Santa Monica, but he would love to take Rose there where he grew up, but had no plans to move there. It held too many memories. After six long years away, Jack decided that maybe it was time to go back there, see what had changed and what it hasn't. Maybe a visit his parents' graves if he could pick up the courage to do it. It was hard when his parents died. He had no other family. They all lived out in the Colorado, and his uncle who lived there, but not by, but not by marriage blood. But he felt alone in the world. He felt that he was the only person in the world, trapped in a small town which led no meaning to him anymore. Before his parents' deaths, he was sure that he would have been settled there and married and raised children there. But now Maggie was three months old, and now old enough to travel even though he didn't like the idea of it. Even though he didn't want to leave his child here, he felt that this was something he had to do. Now that he felt old enough to deal with the grief to face his head on, he was tired of running away from his problems. He knew that there would become a time where he would have to face the past and the time was now here. Today, Rose was out shopping with Jean and Anne for dresses for the upcoming summer, so Jack thought that maybe he could take the trip to them. But of course, it would be nicer to get away from the things around here. He loved New York, but never really felt at home. He was still a drifter by heart, with little Maggie. Now he knew that it wouldn't be happening for a very long time. His daughter's gargles disturbed him for his thoughts. Dressed in crisp and white shirt with pants, Jack then placed an apron around his waist and began to peel some potatoes. He knew Rose wasn't keen on him cooking, but he made the effort. Maggie gargled again, dropping his knife and potatoes on the counter. Jack wandered over to his daughter's crib. He gazed up on him puzzlingly. With those big blue eyes, laughing to himself, he reached down and picked her up, dressed in a pretty white dress with bows. She began to wave her fists around the air. You little adventurer, aren't you? Jack laughing to himself. He, she wanted to see everything. He gently began to tickle his daughter's belly as she began to giggle hysterically. He loved that sound of his daughter so happy. He tickled her again and this time she began to kick her legs just as much as she giggled more. At that moment, Rose emerged from the door and she looked pretty today. She was wearing a light yellow dress which highlighted did her new curvy post baby body. She had chopped her hair a few weeks before just above her shoulders, but of course she was still attractive as ever. Good day shopping? Jack questioned, placing Maggie back in her crib, leaving her to gargle her to herself. Yes, it was. I needed some time away, just the girls and me. I like the time away sometimes. Rose eyed the bowl on the counter suspiciously. Are you cooking? She laughed. Jack knew that he was in trouble, but Jack she laughed before kissing his nose lightly. The thing that Rose said about liking to get away really made Jack think about bringing up the point that was going to Wisconsin earlier. Hey Rose, Jack asked. Rose heard the tone of his voice, how serious it was compared to the playfulness minutes before. What's wrong, darling? Jack pulled Rose to beside him to sit down on the sofa. You know we've talked about going away for some time? 
Maybe to Santa Monica? Or to see your mother one day? Jack asked. Slowly, but not knowing her response would be. Yeah. Well, maybe we could go in a few next few months. Just me and you. Rose stood up immediately. What about Megan? We can't just go gallivanting off now. We have responsibility and we have a child, Jack. Rose fumed. How irresponsible can he get? I know, I know. Jack tried to calm her down. And promised to look after her for a few weeks. It's just I'd really like to show you where I called home, Jack sighed. What do you mean? Rose was puzzled. Home? He was home. I love to take you to Chipotle Falls to show you where I grew up. I like to, to visit my parents' graves with me. I just don't want to ha have the strength to do it alone. We have the money right now, and I want to go when we can. Tearing and tearing pricked Jax's eyes, and Rose could see how much this meant to him. She would have to love to go gone, but they had a baby now. I can't just expect Anna m to have Maggie in a few weeks. It's not fair, Rose sighed. But she offered, Jack stated. He had been telling Anne about that afternoon, about how he wanted to go back to Wisconsin. But now they had Megan, and it would be impossible to travel with a baby. Anne had seen how much Jack wanted to go, and offered to look after Maggie while they were away. She did? Yes. April 1st, 1913. Dear Diary, Jack and I arrived at Chippewa Falls in Wisconsin. This isn't how I imagined it all. It's so picture square. I can imagine Jack is a young boy running around in this town. We're staying in the country inn. It's a very small, quiet hotel. The owners there are a nice old couple. According to Jack, they ran the hotel when he was a young boy. Jack is very happy, but uneasy about being back there. I suspect the memories are killing him. He told me about his parents on the way there, and I would have to love to meet them. They sound such good-hearted people. It's heartbreaking that he has to live without his parents. Jack is such a good man and doesn't deserve to suffer the grief. I miss my father dearly. I think of him daily. He would have loved Megan. She's such a wonderful child. I miss my daughter terribly, but I'm glad to be here in Wisconsin. Think back to it when Jack saved me from jumping overboard almost a year ago to the day. I think about that when he told me he was from Chippewa Falls in Wisconsin. That was when he was ice fishing when he was a child with his father. I can honestly say I would never have imagined me a year on. Never I would have thought of my wildest dreams. I would be here with Jack's hometown. Never mind that I would have been married him or given birth to his child. When I saw him there that night, this man telling me, that he would be prepared to jump overboard if I had to decide to. I thought he was bluffing. This obviously poor Searage boy was telling me what to do. I had immediately remembered my place in society and had told him in many words to leave me alone, but he had to proceed to convince me not to jump overboard. I didn't dislike him. I had the feeling that there was someone special on his own way, but I knew he wasn't special to me. I thought he would never become a larger role in my life. I thought I would never speak to him again. That night, I didn't have feelings for him, feel attracted to him in any way, or think of him in a romantic way. But I did know I would like to get to know him. It wasn't until the evening of April the 13th, after Jack had walked me back to my stater room, when I began to feel ill things stirring inside me. I admire the man. I wanted to live like him. He had the life I've always wanted. I had come my way, way to find him. An interesting, caring people, gentle pe person, of course. He was very handsome in an innocent way. He still is. That night we had gazed at the stars, and I am not afraid to admit that I was curious as to what it would have been like for him to kiss me. Just for a split second. What it would feel like to be kissed by this beautiful man? What would it feel like for him to have me the same attraction, which I strongly felt for him? When Jack told me the next day he was worried about my safety and my life in first class, I had been stunned and overwhelmed, but I was scared. Cal and my mother had sworn to me away from Jack, and I felt guilty for disobeying their orders. But I also felt drawn to Jack for some strange reason. 
It was forbidden, and I think a part of me liked the fun. I did not done an adventurous thing in my life, so sneaking away with Jack meant that I felt that I was free and safe. I felt like a young girl of my age should do. Not to which this burden of marriage to a man that I didn't love upon my soldier so shoulders. As of now, I cannot simply begin to express the love I feel for my husband. Words cannot begin to describe my feelings. As for my daughter, the product of our love, she is an absolute treasure. I look into her eyes and see my husband, and every time I would do so, I could weep tears of happiness. As of tomorrow, I will meet one of Jack's friends from his childhood, which will be nice. I have heard a lot about him. Rose Dawson, Tripola Falls, LSW1. The country inn was only one or two hotels in Tripola country. It was a small place, but on homely. It was a farming country with horse and carriages passing by by carrying hay every free now and again. The roads were long, dirty, and dusty, with tracks imprinted onto the dust. The roads were very long and stretched for what seemed to be like an eternity. So the few people who Rose had met in the small amount of time she had been in Chipotle Falls were very friendly and they and a few who knew Jack from his childhood even told each other their tales of how much terror he was a child. Most of the time the residents were very surprised and to see the face of Jack Dawson in town again. They had expected to never see him again. They thought they would never return to these parts again, especially with a wife in town. But of course, the people there still talked about his parents and their deaths. And it's just to sh went to show you what people well, did around the parts were like. They liked to gossip. Their stares were still filled with sympathy and judgment for him. And he didn't like the person in particular that was happy to see Jack. Alfie Burton, an attractive, tall, dark man with large brown eyes, so ecstatic to see Jack again. He is childhood best friend. From the ages of 5 to 15, they were irresponsible until Jack left in the summer of 1907. They had had a very happy childhood, mucking around together, playing football, and fishing in town by the river. When Jack had begun to show a very good talent for drawing, when he was just 10, it was Elf who had encouraged him to follow his dreams which exactly what young Jack did when his parents had died in a house fire as of July of 1907, leaving him devastated. When Jack was just a 15-year-old boy, but he decided to set on the journey he would never forget, a journey to chase his dreams. Packing the necessities in a small backpack, he had left there not a planning to look back. First, he had ridden a railroad to Montebet Ray, where he worked on his squid boat. He moved there just two months and went to Santa Monica. He had managed to sell a few sketches to help him f them with money for a few weeks. He had heard of stories and seen pictures of Santa Monica's beauty and atmosphere, but now where he was here, from all the artists' eyes, were unbelievable. The place was so alive with, un with fun fair room and roller coasters he rode many times, he actually made himself ill, but he didn't care. This was the life he had always wanted for himself. He would ride horses on the beach and drink cheap beer from a pub near the pier. Before he had gone head out onto the pier just to gaze out into the sea for an hour's time. Just taking the scenery and the sea air. It was beautiful. He had always wanted to go on, out on the sea, but had never been on this ship. Perhaps it would be yet another one of his goals to achieve was said making each day count. It was his motto and his way of life as since his parents died suddenly at a young age. After 17 or 7 months in Santa Monica, he had found his grief ease gradually. He was no longer in pain in blaming himself for his parents' death, and he found out that he didn't miss the place once he called his only home at all. In February of 1908, 16-year-old Jack headed to Los Angeles, then Hollywood. There was always talks of how Hollywood was becoming the most most big city for the silence movies and its stars. So packing up a few of his blinds once again, Jack headed for Hollywood. With his beaming lights and his static atmosphere, Hollywood was certainly all about the stars. Jack even saw his first Nickelodeon Whitsett in Hollywood. 
he was a high class man kissing the hand of a very beautiful young woman and it would amuse him for years to come. Jack was in awe in everything around him, although he didn't really see the steady stars of moving pictures. In June of 1908, Jack had decided to head to Europe when he had saved enough money for a third class ticket to aboard the ship. This again was another dream of Jack's, just blazing on the deck, gazing at the stars, taking a beautiful sea, air, and even unfamiliar surroundings. He had sketched the people on the deck and had some had pay him, but as for the others, he had refused to accept any money. He had always loved the sound of running water and the gushing, probably from the lake nearby his house of Chipotle Falls. First he headed to Greece, explored the Athens and the very ancient buildings. The world was very inspiring to place for to Jack. He had filled a sketchbook after sketchbook with drawings of subjects and people who took interest in. Art was his first and foremost love. He thought that it could never change. Money was tight and he would rarely scrap enough together for a proper lunch or dinner. Talk all that art was really blooming over in Paris. Jack had already planned to go there someday, maybe to make even more money and become a famous artist someday. Italy was Jack's next stop in Europe. Upon arriving, he felt at home at once. He really loved it there. He even found himself a steady job as a right waiter at a small downtown cafe, working for an Italian family named the De Rossi's. They weren't the richest family, but they welcomed him with open arms. The whole family had never met an American before. Mr. D. Rossi was the head of the household. He ruled his family with iron rod and his three children wouldn't get away with anything. His wife Penelope Rossi was a very attractive woman with long mane of thick black hair, chocolate brown eyes and olive skin, which all three of their children had inherited. Stefan was 20 and he too worked at the cafe with his father and brother. Fabrizzo was a middle child and had just left school and began to work at the cafe too. He and Jack were around the same age and they both found a love of art and traveling. They became very good friends in that year which Jack stayed with the De Rossi's. But when Fabrizzo's father suddenly died of a heart attack, it was grieving family but it took Jack in and gave him a bed to sleep and a good evening meal. Fabrizzo's younger sister, Simo, was just 16. She was a pretty little thing and had a very early interest in Jack. When, she, when he wasn't at work, Simo would hang out with him and Fabrizzo when they were sometimes would just hang out alone. Simo would beg him to draw portraits of her and she would giggle and squeal with excitement when he presented the finished sketch to her. On Jack's 18th birthday, he shared his first kiss ever with Selma and when they had taken a walk in that late evening. His heart had pounded and he had stuttered very nervously afterwards. He grew fond of Selma, but they both knew that he couldn't court because of her family if they found out that he'd be a dead man. And besides that, she would always be know of his dreams to visit Paris from the first day they met. So after stealing a few more kisses, Jack decided it was time to move on to Paris of May of 1910, with his best friend Fabrizzo in tow. Leaving Selma behind had been a little harder than he expected. He had feelings which he had never had before. Selma then wept as she had her kiss goodbye. Fabrizzo kissed his ma and siblings goodbye as he and Jack headed to the horizon yet again. But this time he was not alone, he had company. The two shared a passion for adventure and Fabrizzo's dream was to travel to America and become a millionaire, whereas Jack's dream lied in Paris, the art capital of the world, and now, finally, he was going there. To his disappointment, all the French seemed to only take interest in Dadaism and Cubism, but Jack felt that his type of art had no line heart in it, whereas Jack drew from his heart. For him, it was all about living on the streets and putting the amazing city on paper. Not many people took an interest in Jack's art, except for a man in a local bar who offered a few generous amounts of portraits of himself and a very lovely woman named Amelia. Leah, when she undeniably was pretty, with long poker straight black hair, a light brown eyes and she spoke fluently in French. Knowing very little English, her dresses were always very low cut, 
showing ample cleavage, but she was obviously a very good sentinel woman, despite only having one leg. The man had always paid Jack very good money to not say anything about him sketching him, but he never told Jack but why he didn't care at all and he was paid to do it, but put the food on the table in the shelter just a few nights. One night, when Jack had drank a few beers, Amelia offered Jack money to draw her, and he agreed. Upon arriving at the place that, he, that she called home, he noticed more attractive, sensual, provencavitary dressed woman. Amelia laid Jack to her chambers, where she sat down, down and slowly peeled her well clothes off to beg for him to draw her without any on. Jack at that point had never seen a woman without clothes on, and found himself feeling the things that he never felt before. He agreed and blushing each time his, uh, his eyes laid on the most infirmary parts of their body. Upon finishing, she took a seat beside him and gently but unexpectedly kissed her lips. She had looked over his hand into hers and gently brushed her lips to touch it against his knuckles, sending tingles all the way through his body, causing to steer things around how he didn't know how to control. She lowered his hand and guided towards her her private area but uh, not really in that way but kissing him again being flustered Jack pulled away shyly and excused himself with its stuttering after that night Amelia made several more attempts to get Jack in the bed he was very handsome young man and she was very attracted to him romantically but he was always a gentleman and had politely refused each time although he did find someone she had beautiful hands that she could draw them endlessly. And he had quite a few sketches that he had planned to keep for memory of Amelia and her hands. She was also a very attractive woman, but Jack had plans to move on. Paris was done wonders for Jack and his Italian friend Fabrizio. They had begun to grow very becoming good friends during their time in Paris. The best experience by far for Jack was seeing his favorite artist Monette, through the keyhole. It had made him the happiest man he had been that day. In January of 1912, Jack had been taking a break from sketching in the park in the upper class side of Paris. He didn't really like to come this way much, but he had dressed in the best clothes he had owned and walked to the park. He needed the money for his plans was to leave in France soon, maybe for England. Laying a cigarette, Jack rested his back against the bench he was sitting on. The afternoon sun was strong and warm. It was dead at this time. Usually everyone was eating their dinner. Taking off another puff from a smoke, Jack heard a very loud slam of the door. Standing immediately was a very tall dressed lady. Lalic T. He dressed ran from the hotel building. If I read copper curls, this lady looked like an angel. She ran, obviously crying. For a moment, Jack thought of following her to see if she was all right. But a dark-haired man dressed formally, obviously expensive tuxedo, followed her. Picking up his art supplies, Jack immediately left the park, wondering what on earth could possibly be troubling the pretty redhead. By the end of March of 1912, Jack and Febrezzo decided to move on to England. He had heard of many good things about Britain, their, their attractions, their culture, the people. London was one of the places he had planned to visit. After saving up enough money, he took a train to ride from Paris to London. Jack and Fabrizio packed up their belongings yet again and set out for the horizon once again. Upon arriving in London, Jack had noticed a drastic change in the weather. The rain had poured down horridly until it well into March when the British springtime had begun. London had many and many famous sites, including the Westminster Abbey, where the royal and rich people were usually married. Buckingham Palace. It was a very large house where the royals had lived. Big Ben, the huge clock, which looked over the houses of Parliament and River Thames. Jack would take each morning to beneath the bridge and call his bed during the time he had been there, wander around the streets endlessly. It was very different from America. The littlest thing inspired him. Each building, each place, and person was then steeped in culture and history. Towards the end of March 1912, 
the newspapers were going crazy about the new ocean liner, the Titanic. It was the biggest moving object ever made by the hand of man in all history. It was set to sail sail for New York on April the 10th and move the pictures Jack saw in the newspapers. It was certainly a beauty. Fabrizzo had joked about the ship would sail to America before coming a millionaire. England was a good experience for Jack. He had learned a few things, a few met a few nice people, but he knew he could never settle down there. He never felt at home. Jack often pondered his next move. Spain, Egypt, Holland, of out of all the places that appealed to him, he just didn't have the money to survive in London, let alone move on again. London was a place for mostly rich people. Jack decided to move on to the south of 5th of April, 1912, to South Ampton. He and Fabrizio decided to watch the Titanic as they set off to their maiden voyage. Jack couldn't wait. This day would be that he would go down in history. Sab South Abrinton was the little less cultured in London. The English weather continued to be pleasant throughout early April. Fabrizio and Jack had sheltered under a small bridge near a river where they would wash each morning and evening. Their money was tighter than ever, but it was good. He loved waking up in the morning, even though it was a cold, hard floor. He loved it not knowing what's going to happen that day or he would meet that was all lined up. He loved the mystery of life and wondered what card he would get dealt with next. Jack then took life as to come at it. He didn't have a plan. He just wandered and drift. It had been five hard long days since his parents died. Even years. Five years? It was just five years ago. Jack Dawson was just a young boy with a dream now he was in here and was in England. Out of all the places to watch history go down, the biggest ocean liner in the world was about to set sail. On the morning of April 10th, 1912, Jack and Fred Rizzo had woken up around 8, washed before heading to the docks. People were already gathered around the dock's edge. The Titanic, in all of her glory, stood proudly on the harbor. She was certainly beautiful, and Jack could see what all the fuss was about. All the months of anticipation, the papers had made her sound fantastic. And here, much larger than life, was better than the press that she had made her sound. Settling in a small job near the docks, Jack and Fabrizio found a spot near the window to sit with two Swedish men, both nodding their heads in acknowledgement. Jack immediately pulled out a sketchbook and began to draw her. The Swedish men were both playing poker while over having a beer. Fabrizio joined their party, and minutes later so did Jack. The drawing he was doing when engrossed was suddenly forgotten. The Swedes were certainly passionate as the players, as they bet their third class Titanic Nick tickets in the game. Jack also bet everything he had, five pounds and a few pieces of French and Italian change. Fabrizio had been mad, muttering Italian swear words, but Jack laughed at him. He was confident though as to win those tickets. He was feeling lucky today, like there was going to be a beginning of something. A new in amazement. But what if he didn't have the chance to go home? Jack worried slightly. He could be face of Wisconsin again after five long years? No, he couldn't. There was always New York. Feed years they were hiring artists to draw posters for plays. Maybe he could do that for a while. Jack's thoughts were interrupted with a loud beeping of recall of a car outside the door. Looking on time on his pocket watch in the middle of the table, it was 20 to 12 and he watched a Riku car pull further into the docks then stopped, as well as a dressed male Calfer opened the door to the back seat of the Renault and held his hand to a stiffly to a woman who looked gracefully and pulled herself out of the car. She lifted her head and Jack thought that he recognized her, but then he shook his head. She was obviously a very rich woman with the look of her clothes as she thought of the wonder of the ship was so calmly and thought it was just a scrap of metal. Just then Jack lit a cigarette and turned his attention back to his game of poker. Minutes later, a smile appeared on Jack's face. He had a full house. Fabrizio revealed his cards. Nothing. The two Swedes then revealed theirs. Crap! Two pairs. I'm sorry Fabrizio. Jack then turned to his friend, whose face fell. He began mumbled something madly in Italian. 
I'm so sorry, you're not going to be seeing your ma again for a long time. Jack spoke over Fabrizzo. His face had a confused look. Because we're going to America. Full house, boys. Jack whooped happily as Fabrizzo began to collect their winnings and scraped them onto his backpack. Olaf stood and looked at Jack with contempt. He would be taking their tickets to aboard Titanic. He grabbed Jack roughly by the scarf of his neck and he had thought of something about hitting him. Jack squinted his eyes, expecting a huge thump, until Olaf turned his attention to his brother and knocked him out of his chair. Jack laughed before helping Fabrizzo collecting their winnings. I'm going home, was all Jack repeated out loud. After five years, he would return home on the Titanic. Luck was there for him. The pub keeper reminded them that the Titanic was due to leave in five minutes. Grabbing their backpacks, they ran for the gangway of the Titanic. Making there just in time, aboarding the ship, Jack thought of it just how lucky they were. If they could win those tickets, who knows what else luck would bring them when he returned home, or even aboard the ship.